She went on to marry Harry Truman. Yes. Oh, okay then. Do Harry you think Truman. anybody watching knows who Harry no, Truman is? They don't is? even know. You honestly, no. They think did, they, they, they think we're referring to the Truman Show. Yeah. They, no, did, no, no idea. No, no idea. Do they know that his middle name S? didn't stand for anything. It was just Harry S. S. Truman. Truman. Like we make people's don't name, know. middle names up and use F for another reason. Harry Truman. You even said what's his daughter's name and I said Margaret. Margaret I knew it. that, it's scary. Mm -hmm. Welcome to PTI boys and girls. In today's episode, Joe Burrow throws it 61 times. The Nuggets and Lakers take the court and Josh Donaldson gets ejected in a memorable way. But we begin today with the Boston Celtics blowing another big lead to the Miami Heat last night and losing again. The Celtics were outscored by 20 points in the third quarter. And after the game, there was shouting emanating from the Boston locker room. It is being reported by The Athletic that Jalen Brown and Marcus Smart had to be separated. After all that, Brown said, quote, this series is far from over, unquote. Wilbon, is it far from over? Well, not necessarily. I mean, if you go 3-0, down or 3 0 up, then, it, then it's essentially over, citing the history of the league. I, don't, I, I think there's a long way to go, potentially, and I think there will be a long way to go. I, I now, Tony, don't really think the Celtics will win. I think Miami will win, but I still think it'll be a long, and it's already been a fascinating series. But, Tony, I'm, I'm going to attack a little bit or at least criticize my brethren, the people in our business. We, we, we used to cover a lot of games, you and I, for like 40 years each. And we heard screaming outside locker rooms all the time. And Gary Washburn for the Boston Globe, he's a veteran sports writer and a damn good one. And he made this observation in his piece. But I hear a lot of other people who never covered anything screaming about how, oh, this is crazy, and they were fighting, and there you could hear sounds. To me, if you lose these two games the Celtics lost, you ought to hear that. Anything less than that, they're not taking it seriously. I throw clubs and scream when I lose to you in a friendly golf match on a Saturday afternoon. They damn better be angry and upset with themselves and each other. And to say this is a big deal, that part of it? I, I don't get that, Tony. So I'm going to leave that aside, and I'm going to go back to the question, does it feel like it's over? It feels right now like it's two games from over, and I like Boston, and I've sat here and picked Boston, yep. and I look at Miami, and they've got, they've got what it takes. They're a really quality team. Jimmy Butler makes big plays. Adebayo makes big plays. Goran Dragic makes big plays. Robinson and Hero make big shots. You watch these... You know, you can lose, you can play pretty well and lose in four games if the other team plays better. Miami, you said this the other day, that Miami's good from the top down, and you're right. Pat Riley and Eric Spolstra, and they got a team, their coach plays a lot of different people, and you know what, Mike? They're ready to go in the game because they've played in yeah. all of these games. Yeah. I still like Boston. I'm not knocking Boston. I am saying to you that Miami looks better right now. Tony, I'll they just mention do. this. I, I was trying to talk a friend, my friend Hans off the ledge, Celtic fanatic. And I said, hey, Denver was two games down twice right. in the last three weeks. They came back to force game sevens and won. Also, Toronto was two nothing down to Boston. They were within a possession, within a play, a single play from winning a seven game series. So no, two nothing doesn't make a series over. You'd like your Let position me just when you're up thing. to, but it doesn't mean anything definitively. Let me suggest this. There's a lot more pressure on Boston than there is on Miami. And what Miami looks very good at is understanding, other than Jimmy Butler, everybody knows his role. Jimmy Butler can do everything because he's earned that. If Boston presses and tries to win three games in one night, they, done. they could be out They're of done. here. By the way, Jimmy they Butler, real be... quickly... Jimmy Butler scored 14 points last night and, to me, was the best player on the floor. I mean, yeah, I, I know Gordon is. Dragic again had the, the points necessary. But Jimmy Butler, Tony, the plays that need yes. to be made, as you mentioned, he makes them all the time. It's great to watch him. He doesn't have to score 40 to do it or shoot step-back threes all night. The Western Conference Finals tip off tonight. The Lakers haven't played since eliminating the Rockets last Saturday, while the Nuggets are fresh off their Game 7 win over the Clippers on Tuesday. LeBron says his respect for the Nuggets is, quote, out of this world, close quote. 
Tone, do you respect the Nuggets enough to favor them in this series? Uh, no, I favor LeBron. I've sat here on this show a lot of times and said, you don't go broke betting on LeBron. Okay, their season series was 3-1, to one, L.A., and the one game Denver, Le Denver won, LeBron did not play in that game. I I'm just going to say this to you, Mike. We can talk about the basketball part of it all you want. But I think that LeBron, in the year that Kobe Bryant died, I think LeBron has assumed the mantle of leadership of the Lakers, of the franchise, not just the team. He's put that on his shoulders. I think he's going to drive that team to win a championship. Mike, I really do. I think LeBron at this point in his career is concerned mainly with legacy. And if I think that, and it's occurred to me, it's occurred to him 20 times already. Yeah. So I do like the position the Lakers are in. There, there are basketball things we could talk about, starting actually with Anthony Davis, Tony, and, sure. and what it is that his talent and size and his hunger to be in the finals and win, present, all of that, sure, we can start. We can start with Anthony Davis. And I'm going to dovetail off what you said about LeBron. I mean, the one thing the Clippers didn't have, as it turns out, they got a leader in their coach, Doc Rivers. But in terms of players, I mean, guys who can galvanize a team, guys who can challenge a team, guys who can threaten teammates for being lesser when he doesn't want them to be lesser, in that category of guys like, you know, Russell, and, 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 and Magic and Bird and Jordan and Kobe. When you start talking that group of guys, LeBron James is in that group. And you know LeBron James has been watching all of this so closely. And he's got things in his favor he can point to. Denver coming back twice is all you need. But these other series, LeBron can and will use it all. We've seen him do it time after time. I just, I am not going to underestimate Denver anymore. I don't want to get into a prediction about this series. What I do predict, though, is LeBron James will have the Lakers playing as well as they yeah. can play from tip-off tonight. So I like Denver, and you have to like Denver. Denver was down 3-1 in two series, and they won, and that's never been done before. They've got the grit that Bruce Arians wishes Tom Brady had. And Jokic is wonderful, and Murray is wonderful. Anthony Davis is, is really good. There's a quote by the coach, Mike Malone, and he said, the biggest question is, are our guys satisfied? Because they've already made history. And you do wonder about that. It's a very interesting concept. Wilbon, you took your shots at Wingfoot yesterday. You said it was far too easy. It was. Well, it's harder today. Yeah. Almost everyone who played in the morning was over par, although Dustin Johnson was even. The highlight of the morning was you boo Bryson DeChambeau, <laughs> eagling number nine, his last hole to take the clubhouse lead at minus three. What would you like to talk about? I mean, we can first, let, let me say, yesterday it was easy and it was overhyped. Today, Wingfoot was what we're told is going to be. You know, they were what we thought they were, to, to, to paraphrase the great Dennis Green. So, so Wingfoot was what we were promised it was going to be today. And with the weather cooling down and drying out and the greens drying out, no moisture, it seems like they're going to have that challenge all weekend, Tony. Friday, Saturday, Sunday are going to be tougher than Thursday. I, I, I'm, I'm just fascinated to see who can keep us calm. I mean, Tiger, you know, I mean, Tiger had a situation on, on, on 18 out. again, in which out. it was like you yeah. and me on the weekend yeah, flubbing a no. shot. Tiger and it's and just Phil, like, see you around. Phil. See you around. Wow. Phil, Phil, Phil enjoy your Amstel light. Oh, enjoy that because you're out now. of the tournament. Come on. Here, look, here's, here's a couple of things. First of all, you slammed Wingfoot and you praised your own course, which I loved, Olympia Fields. I've loved that you, you, you praised your own course. But it, the people at Wingfoot wanted it to be harder. The USGA set the pins. All right, now they set them differently today. I talked to Steve Sands early this morning. He said it's windy already. It's going to be windy all day. The guys in the afternoon are going to have it tough. The three leaders, Reed and McElroy and Thomas, in their first nine holes were all in yeah. plus. They were all in plus at that point. So it's a much harder golf course than it has been. I think McElroy may have been plus five on his first nine or first eight or something like that. This four, is the wing foot that everybody eight, expected. I know that. Dustin Johnson at plus three, he's still, I think, in it. I don't think anybody runs away with it. And I'm pretty feeling pretty good about Thomas, Shawfley, and Webb Simpson, who I picked to win this thing. Webb They're, Simpson. I, you know. Again, yeah. Webb Simpson's Simpson. got one of these trophies. He's got one. Yeah. 
And Webb Simpson, yeah. you know, Tony, had look, looked pretty good early in his round as well. Look, there's a lot of, again, calm. You, when you, if you start talking about calm personalities and what it's going to take just to emotionally get through this weekend. And Do we you put think the Webb shambo? Simpson, I didn't. Let's go to DeChambeau for okay. a second, because I didn't think this was his kind of course. I thought he'd try to overpower it. He'd end up in the rough. It wouldn't work. But it looks like he knows what he's doing. Well, Can you see him winning? I don't know about winning. He, Tony, he's so strong. He's so big and strong that he can get out of that rough. I mean, he's swinging what amounts to, what, an eight, an eight iron every time and out of the rough. He is so big and strong now that he seems to be able to overpower the rough. If he can Looks do that, that all weekend, he's going to be in a pretty good position. Let's take a break. Coming up, Baker Mayfield played well last night. And how should Joe Burrow feel about throwing 61 times? Burrow played last night? Oh, wow. Yeah. What's the word for how Josh Donaldson got himself ejected after hitting a home run? Two rounds under par this morning, yesterday. 61 times last night. He should feel empowered. If that offensive line of Cincinnati doesn't get him killed, it is obvious that the coaching staff understands they may have found a diamond here. He threw 61 times with no interceptions. Jameis Winston would have had 10 interceptions. He completed 37 of these passes, basically 10 yards a pop. How much more do you need to see? I know it's early, Mike, but in the last drive of the first game, he went 70 yards without any timeouts, should have, you know, the, the shank of Potomac's field goal killed him. And I know he didn't win last night, but it looks like he knows what he's doing out there. Let, let's have a minute of real talk here on PTI. Did you actually watch any of that game last night? Because if you did, I'm going to call you something that you often call people, which is a dope. Did you watch this uh, in live time? When you say any, what do you mean by any? A snap. No, like me and the not. Cubs no hitter the other night. Did you catch anything? <laughs> Saw it this morning. I did. Not Saw last night, morning. no. Well, let me, let me just admit freely, <laughs> I didn't good. watch any of this. Not everything's a big deal, even though people would have you think that everything that happens in the NFL is a big deal. I realize a great many people watch. Thankfully, I wasn't one of them, and he should feel Joe Burrow betrayed because he should never in this time in his life be asked by those coaches playing with that team and that line to Drop back and throw it 61 times. It could be suicidal. It's stupid, but he should feel betrayed. Let me tell you who liked him. Troy Aikman liked him. Next. Last one. Josh Donaldson made a blank move to get ejected from yesterday's game. Pouty. He was mad at the umpire. He thought the umpire squeezed him on a couple of calls in two different at-bats. He had words with the umpire. So when he hit it out, he decided, I'm going to show up blue right now. He, he drags his foot, kicks dirt uh, along the home plate. You know he's going to be kicked out. He knows he's going to be kicked out. And he gets kicked out. And you know what? They were then losing the game. And his number in the lineup came up. And he wasn't available. And the guy who replaced him, Mike, struck out. And they lost by so one. So who wins in this? They lost by who one wins? run. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. should feel Pouty. Donaldsonian. Because this is what he does, Tone. He's both a just, I mean, he's a dramatic power hitter for a guy who's not all that big. And he, I mean, he can hit it out. He's one of those guys to me, Tone. Yeah. When you think about going big to player. see, take your kid to see somebody who comes into your town, you want to see him. Donald's is one of those guys. And yet he's, he comes off as such a jerk. He's not pouty. He's sour. And he's a bad man. I'm sorry. I mean, I, you know, just because you might take somebody to see him, to pay to see him, doesn't mean he's like one of the great players of all time. And he behaves badly often. And so, yeah. Donald Sonian, yeah. this is what he does. Yeah. Part of what he, he does. wanted to get kicked out. He did he got get kicked, kicked out. out. He lost. ultimately hurt his team. Good. Hurt his team. Good. That's it. The word nerd. Should I like that? Wins again. Let's take one last break, but still to come, the Yankees are suddenly mashing the ball. More Yankee talk. And a special day for Cam Newton ahead of his showdown with Russell Wilson and the Seahawks. I don't know about word nerd. I've got a doctorate. I grant you it's time, people. Happy 52nd birthday, Tony Kukoc. Kukoc was one of the best European players to come to the NBA, and he had great success. He was on three NBA champions with Michael Jordan in Chicago and was sixth man of the year in 1996. Kukoc was undoubtedly a role model for Dirk Nowitzki, the greatest European player in history, 
and his game looks like a blueprint for Luka Doncic, who should surpass even Nowitzki. But as we learned in the Jordan documentary Last Dance, the road to Chicago wasn't always paved with good intentions. Jordan, and especially Scottie Pippen, resented that Jerry Krause coveted Kukoc. So in the 1992 Olympics, Jordan and Pippen set out to destroy Kukoc on the court. When Kukoc's Croatian team played the dream team in a group game, Jordan, and especially Pippen, hounded Kukoc into a four-point game on two for 11 shooting and seven turnovers. In the gold medal game against the US, Kukoc had 16 points and nine assists, but the point was made. Tony, it was a bit of an initiation. There was a little hazing in that Olympics, which was tough to watch. It probably helped Kukoc in the long run. And he became very close with Michael and Scotty along the way, to, to my knowledge, and I have some experience with it. I've played a round of golf or so with Tony Kukoc. He's a wonderful guy to be around. He loves both of them, no matter what happened in 1992. So good for them, worked out. Happy anniversary, Cam Newton. On this day nine years ago, the number one overall pick in the 2011 NFL Draft by the Carolina Panthers set an NFL rookie record by throwing for 400 yards in each of his first two games. Newton had just come out of a spectacular Heisman Trophy season at Auburn, and his trajectory all the way through his MVP and Super Bowl season in 2015 was nothing but up. But it turns out those are his only 400-yard games he ever had in the 126 games he has played. Newton began to get hurt. His productivity and availability declined. Carolina ultimately had no desire to keep him, and he became a free agent. He went unsigned for a long time and finally landed in New England on a one-year bargain deal. So far, Newton seems to have found tranquility under Bill Belichick and Josh McDaniels, but it's early. The three words most associated with Cam Newton's career now are if he's healthy. All right, Tony, what's it going to be this week in Seattle for Cam Newton? Are we going to see him running the ball like he was at Auburn and like he did last week for Bill Belichick in their debut together? Or are we going to see Cam Newton throw the ball, which he can also do, as evidenced by those 400-yard passing games at the beginning of his career? You want to hold the ball against Russell Wilson. You don't want to give him the ball, so they'll run a lot. Happy trails to the New York Islanders. They took Tampa Bay to overtime last night but ended up losing game six and losing the Eastern Conference final two to one. This puts Tampa Bay and Dallas in the Stanley Cup final, the first time ever that both teams are from traditional hockey hotbed Sunbelt states. It's also the first time an assistant coach will face the man he assisted in a final. Dallas head coach Rick Bonus assisted John Cooper in Tampa for five years. Winning playoff series in overtime is the norm for Tampa Bay this year. They beat Columbus in overtime in game five to win that series. They beat Boston in double overtime in game five to win that series. And they beat the Islanders in overtime to win this series. Let us credit Tampa Bay for taking to heart what happened to them last year when they were the number one seed and they were swept in the first round by Columbus. They buried that embarrassment by beating Columbus this time around. If you are looking for a reason to pick Tampa Bay over Dallas, note that in the last four NHL seasons, no team has won as many games as Tampa Bay. Tony, I'm going to give Tampa Bay a little institutional credit. I'm not going to suggest that they're the Montreal Canadien of the 50s and the 60s and 70s. I'm not going to suggest that. But this is their third time in the Stanley Cup final. Um, they beat Calgary in 04 in seven-game series, lost to the Blackhawks in 15 in a six-game series. But this is their third time. And you know what? For teams coming to the Sun Belt, which hadn't been all that long anyway, it's pretty good. It was really nice of you to mention how the Blackhawks beat them. That's well, very I should nice. leave that uh, out. We, we, are, we are original six guys. How do you feel about 